the question is why? Why do parents hate YouTube? Um, and why do they hate YouTube channels like Caillou or Peppa Pig or um, Blippi? Like why, why so much hate around all of these YouTube channels? So when we were growing up, cable TV was pretty much the norm. I mean, if you didn't have cable TV, people were like, what's wrong with you? Or they, they felt that that was very much not the normal. Uh, so we would all watch the same episodes as our friends. So there was a common ground of what we would talk about. Uh, television shows were required to have a rating so that they made sure that they were age appropriate. Now, this means that all of the, the content was carefully reviewed by the content raters and often shows were revised so that they would get a lower age rating so it could appeal to more uh, children or more families. But we're in a very different world right now. Today, over 500 hours of video is uploaded every minute on YouTube. So it's no longer possible to review all of the content that is uploaded like including this, this stream. So if we rely on, so we have no choice but to rely on AI to make automatic decisions for us. And these decisions are based on how much time, watch time, you spend watching certain shows. And so the longer you spend watching, the more ads that can be presented and the more money that YouTube makes. It's not just YouTube, like any social media platform also uses the same technique as well. So if you're on Instagram or TikTok, it's the same. Snapchat is also the same. So this means what you get presented next on YouTube doesn't depend on content ratings by people, uh, but it, it's really about what makes you watch longer. And there's an evolutionary explanation for the, let's call it the aggressive and the promiscuous um, Elsagate videos on YouTube. So everyone's familiar with Elsagate? These were extreme videos that featured Elsa, like somebody dressed as Elsa. Uh, wearing promiscuous clothing or in relatively violent like types of aggressive acts. And so why? So why did those ones bubble up to the top? Why did why were those shown on YouTube kids as some of the most popular as opposed to other videos that are uploaded? Well, since we don't consciously control those milliseconds that we spend watching videos, um, our unconscious animal instincts take over. If you think about it, aggression, it's connected to survival, right? Like this is, we needed it to survive. And arousal um, is connected to reproduction. And so there's just like inherent things that caused us like just evolutionary things that caused us to watch those a little bit longer. It could be just a few milliseconds, not that we were consciously trying to watch those things. No, by by no means. It's just we don't control those things. We don't control how many milliseconds we watch posts. So how does all this uh, connect to animated characters like uh, Caillou and uh, Peppa Pig? Well, <laughs> it means that the shows where the main character is mean or aggressive to their siblings. Um, for example, maybe they're not sharing any of their toys, or maybe they're saying mean things to their parents. Those generate more watch time. Because I mentioned like aggression, like we, we just tend to spend a little bit more time. The if the post is more aggressive. Um, Blippy, are you guys familiar with Blippy? You watch that show? It's like a really young kids one. Hmm. It's another example of 
extreme aggression. Because Blippi, um, and I, I love this explanation from other, like they're, they're media creators for children. Uh, it's part of a Facebook group that I'm a part of. Uh, they said that it's this kind of extreme aggression where he exists in a world that's focused on things like fire trucks or helicopters uh, rather than people. See, what's interesting about this is that in this case, Blippi, he exists in this world where everyone else who might compete for the same toys has been defeated, has been conquered. There's just you and the toy. There's nothing else that, that there's nothing else holding you back, right? Um, it's a very interesting way of looking at uh, children's media that um, it was really the, the children and media side that exposed me to this. Um, but is that making sense so far? Like, um, how is the, the media, like, how is it different than what we watched? Um, say, what did, what parents watched as kids? I mean, just contrast this with your parents being exposed to Sesame Street as children. And you see that a lot of the focus in that show was on modeling. How do we relate with other people? Or maybe it wasn't people, it could be Grover, or it could be one of like Cookie Monster, it could be like other characters, but it was about relating with others. And what this show did is it reinforced uh, what parents were already saying, uh, which made parents like a lot more comfortable um, putting their kids in front of it. And there's an issue though, it's not going to generate as much watch time as something that is the complete opposite of what your parents tell you to do. Because as a uh, child, like that's exactly what you want to do. It's, it's one of the reasons why, like, uh, Curious George, he's always like super curious and like parents would want him to not explore, but he always wants to explore. And that's kind of what makes uh, that show fun. Right, it's just um, doing the opposite and seeing what the consequences are. Uh, but in this case, it's just any show that you know shows aggression, because the the algorithm, the AI, is not really looking for you know what's going to be beneficial for your kid. Um, and this is key because we we wonder, oh, there's like a lot more like behavioral challenges. Um, I previously talked about those five people, right? Like I mentioned before that we are really the sum of the five people closest to us. So if we spend a lot of time watching an influencer on YouTube or a channel on YouTube, uh, we are very likely to take on some of their habits as well. Um, so that's why it's very important for us to make sure that that person that they're watching um, as parents, uh, that there's somebody that we want to be, we want to become, we want to be like them uh, before investing the time and the attention on that particular character. So, you no, know, overall, it's it's not meant to be a a rain on your parade. Uh, you know, at the end. We parents, we're just curious about your interests. And what we want to do is we want to see how we can help you achieve your goal quicker, faster. Is it, If there's anything that we can do, if there's anybody that we know that can help you with your goal, we want to reach out to them. And so if we build this habit of teaching what we learn online, so you watch a video and then for the purpose of learning how to do something, and you decide, okay, I'm going to teach it right away, or I'm going to show somebody how it works, then we're going to remember what we watched because we're using it right away. Um, and this is the, the key about our memory is our brains are wired like such that we can sit for hours watching video after video and not really learn anything. Our brains are incredibly efficient at forgetting things that we don't use. So it's better to just start doing something first and then watch the videos uh, about the skill that you're missing rather than just watch a bunch of videos first. You know, when you watch um, 
YouTube videos, you see a lot of very like successful influencers. Like they're they're wildly successful on YouTube or maybe on Twitch. Um, so it seems like success online should be easy. Well, a 2018 study from Germany found that 96.5% of creators did not make enough to surpass the US poverty line in 2018. Of those with more than um, basically in order to make it you had to be part of that 3.5%. Um, and that meant you had over 1.4 million monthly views. Uh, and then you would kind of see enough ad revenue to make it above the, the US poverty line, they don't pay you a lot for the views. So you generate millions of views for them, but they they give you kind of like poverty line level uh, wages. So I think that the the key thing here is that every breakthrough YouTube creator has some unique advantage that they have just grown over time. And I think the key here is make sure that you're growing your skills first, right? So make sure you've got something that you do better than anyone else, right? You just keep building up that skill because that's what people really are going to your channel for. And then it's good to have multiple ways to monetize that skill. So for example, if YouTube just changes all of a sudden the way that they pay creators, you have a backup just in case. Uh, for some YouTube creators, this could be a merch merchandise store. Maybe they sell uh, t shirts that you know, fit with their theme, maybe they sell certain types of mugs or cups or uh, different type of paraphernalia. It could be an online course that you offer. Maybe you go to Coursera, or maybe you set up your own Kajabi. There are many different ways you can do it. Or it could even be a Patreon, uh, or a similar service where people are paying you for every video that you produce, and you're giving them some exclusive benefit, such as like behind the scenes that they're really interested in seeing. The key here is that you're going to have way more stability if you have recurring revenue. And so like I focus a lot on recurring revenue because Otherwise, your your income is just up and down uh, every month. And that's a really tough situation to be in because like you could find yourself, oh, suddenly I can't pay rent, or suddenly, oh, I don't have enough money for food, like that's a really hard situation to be in. So either save up enough funds so that you you don't have that kind of situation, or look at uh, ways that you can generate recurring revenue if possible. Now, you might think, well, why? Why bother with this? this whole revenue thing? Why don't I just like move for more subscribers? I'm just looking to be popular anyways, I don't really care about, you know, making money, especially like if you're still in school, maybe at this time, you're like money is not a big deal. Well, keep in mind that your number of non paying subscribers is simply a vanity metric. Um, having millions of non paying subscribers, it, I mean, it feels good. But it doesn't necessarily uh, put a put a living wage into your hands. And so the key is maybe don't expect that to be your main source of income to start. Many of the, the people that I've seen uh, edge YouTubers that have moved full time, they they had some other job, they worked in a different place to start with. And they they already were successful before they decided to quit their job and then go full time. And if you can, congratulations, I mean, that that is a great place to be in, because then you have a lot more creative control. And that's, in some cases better than having another company tell you, oh, you can only talk about certain things. Uh, but the key is, you're running like a small, like a new business, essentially, when you're running a channel. So make sure that you're testing the value hypothesis and you figure out like what you can do to, uh, better than everyone else uh, that people will pay for. <laughs> That's the key. What will people pay for? Um, if you're not sure where to get started, I'd say, well, you've already got followers. You've already got some people who are watching. Just ask them, find out what they would like to see from you. What else would they what would be really helpful? Sometimes, you know, going, hey, um, 
like for example, uh, Alice is on the call today. Do you mind if I use you? <laughs> um, say like Alice, hey, um, I see you're, you're watching my channel. Is there anything I can do like to to help you with where you're going right now? What could I do to help further your goals? And just like be genuine. We're trying to help each other out. That's the purpose of these things. Um, and so sometimes we don't know, and sometimes it takes a while for us to get started. That's okay. We don't need to have everything figured out. We just need to be talking because at the end of the day. It's not really influence unless there's that back and forth. That's like one of the reasons why I I love live is is with live you can you can have a back and forth conversation. You can ask questions and uh, you can you can see people's responses. This is great. So